Uh, so welcome everyone to the afternoon program for uh, today's workshop. Um, I'd like to thank everyone so far for the very like, positive atmosphere during the last couple of days. Uh, by now you're probably familiar with the concept. So this talk is going to be one hour total that includes a question session at the end. Um, short clarifications, just interrupt and ask long form, deeper questions, maybe delay those to the end of the talk. Um, and I'll hand over the word to Roman. Hey, um, hello everybody. Uh, so first, I would like to uh, thank the organizer very much for uh, setting up this very nice event and also for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research. So uh, in this presentation, I will discuss uh, the leaky boundary conditions for all lambda, uh, which I think is a title that uh, fits perfectly into this conference. And uh, I will also discuss BMS symmetries and uh, flat limits. So as we said, uh, if you have any question or remark during the presentation, do not uh, hesitate to uh, interrupt me. So the work that I'm going to uh, present is uh, based on the following main reference that have been done in collaboration with uh, Geoffrey Compare, who is professor at the University of Brussels, and Adrien Ferrucci, who is a postdoc at uh, TU Vienna. So here's the plan of the presentation. Uh, first, I would like to uh, motivate the concept of leaky boundary conditions for the various kinds of uh, asymptotics. And then I will uh, specify the analysis to uh, asymptotically, locally, the sitter and anti the sitter space time. Um, after that, I will focus on a specific case of uh, leaky boundary conditions that leads to some uh, BMS symmetries in uh, presence of a non-vanishing cosmological constant. And after that, I will discuss some flat limit procedure to recover the results of uh, flat space. So um, leaky boundary conditions in gravity are defined as boundary condition that yield some flux through the conformal boundary. So in particular, in this framework, uh, the charge that you can construct and that are associated with the symmetries uh, preserving these leaky boundary conditions uh, will not be conserved. And so this uh, framework describes typically open gravitational system. So first, let me focus on the case of asymptotically flat spacetime, which are uh, depicted in this uh, conformal diagram here. Uh, in this context, uh, as, uh, leaky boundary conditions are absolutely essential uh, if you want to consider radiative spacetime in your analysis at null infinity. And indeed, in a work, uh, in a series of work in the 60s, uh, Bondi, Vandenburg, uh, Metzner, and Sachs uh, showed that the non conservation of the charge contained very important information, uh, such that the Bondi mass loss formula which tells you that the mass of the system uh, decreases in time due to the, the emission of the gravitational waves going through the space-time boundary. So this theoretical result was one of the striking arguments to um, show, to demonstrate the existence of the gravitational waves uh, at a nonlinear level of the theory. So uh, leaky boundary conditions are also uh, very important in asymptotically the sitter spacetime. Uh, and indeed, if you impose strong boundary conditions here at the future space-like boundary, square plus, that eliminate the radiation that, that goes through, uh, then it will constrain backward in time uh, the Cauchy problem uh, in the sitter. So you will eliminate generic solution in your uh, phase space, and you don't want to do that. So uh, it is useful to allow uh, leaks through this boundary here. So uh, now in asymptotically ADS space time, uh, most of the previous analysis uh, considered uh, what we call conservative or reflective boundary conditions. And they are depicted on this uh, diagram here. And basically, you impose boundary conditions such that um, the, the gravitational waves are just bouncing on the conformal boundary. 
So in this framework, the charges uh, will be conserved. Uh, and you can make uh, the Barshner principle well defined. So this will describe a closed gravitational system. So for example, in the context of ABS CFT, it will typically impose uh, some Dirichlet boundary conditions by freezing the boundary metric in your space time. So you are in this uh, configuration. However, some uh, recent considerations suggest uh, to consider also leaky boundary conditions in ADS. Uh, so let me motivate uh, these points. Uh, first, if you are interested to know what are the most general boundary conditions in asymptotically ADS spacetime, uh, then it's useful to allow some flux to go through the spacetime boundary because uh, this enables to relax uh, the boundary structure and find more symmetries into your asymptotic uh, symmetry group. Um, a point that is related to that is uh, the fact that if you want to have some BMS symmetries uh, in presence of non-vanishing cosmological constants, then you are forced to have some leaks to the boundary. So I will discuss that in the second part uh, of this talk. A third point comes uh, if you are interested by uh, the black hole evaporation problem. Uh, it has been, uh, uh, let's say, useful uh, to add a reservoir to your space time here so that the, the Hawking radiation can actually escape from ADS and the black hole can uh, evaporate. And finally, a fourth point is that if you consider a brain embedded in, uh, in ADS, it's uh, natural to allow some flux going through the brain. And uh, if you push this uh, scenario to uh, the conformal boundary, then you end up typically with uh, some leaky boundary conditions. So leaky boundary conditions are interesting for all these kinds of asymptotics, I have as I have tried to uh, argue. So for asymptotically flat, uh, DS and ADS spacetime. And in particular, I would like to uh, insist on this point. It's absolutely essential to consider leaky boundary conditions if you want to consider uh, holography in asymptotically flat spacetime at null infinity from a 4D bulk, 3D boundary perspective. Otherwise, you don't capture um, radiative spacetime. So the goal of this talk is to provide a unified description of uh, leaky boundary conditions. And uh, to do so, I will start from uh, asymptotically locally uh, de-sitter and anti-de-sitter spacetime, where I will uh, provide a very detailed analysis. Then I will impose some particular sets of leaky boundary conditions to find these uh, BMS symmetries uh, in presence of non-vanishing cosmological constant. And after that, I will take uh, the flat limit of these results to uh, deduce some uh, uh, aspects of asymptotically flat spacetime. OK, so uh, let me start with uh, the case of asymptotically locally uh, de sitter and anti de sitter spacetime. So I will work in d plus one dimension, uh, d plus one dimension of bulk, and uh, d is the dimension of the boundary. I will work in the starobinsky fefferman gram gauge where the metric takes uh, the following form. And uh, the coordinates here are given by uh, the following. So you have the rho coordinate, uh, which is zero at the conformal boundary, and that becomes positive when you go into the bulk of the spacetime. Uh, so it will be a space-like coordinates in ADS and a time-like coordinates in uh, the sitter. And you also have these XA coordinates that are just the transverse coordinates with respect to, to rho. Um, so the analysis will be valid for both signs of uh, the cosmological constant. And in particular, I will introduce this eta, uh, which is just uh, plus one in ADS and uh, minus one in DS. So now you can solve uh, the Einstein's equation in the Pfeffermann-Graham gauge, and uh, you get the following expansion. 
And what you can show is that this metric is completely determined once you provide uh, the leading order here, which is uh, this boundary metric, G0, and uh, this order, GD, in the expansion. So once you provide these data, you can reconstruct all your metric by solving Einstein's equation iteratively. Um, so here, this uh, GD order in the expansion is actually related to this uh, holographic stress energy tensor uh, that plays a fundamental role in the uh, ids cft dictionary. Um, and uh, basically, you can show that with Einstein's equation, it is divergence-free. So it satisfies this condition. And it's also trace-free for uh, odd dimensional uh, boundary. And it will, be, it will have a trace for even dimensional boundary, which is a signal that you have some uh, vile anomalies in the dual theory. So um, now you can look at the diffeomorphism that preserves this uh, starobinsky pfefferman gram gauge. And if you do the computation, you will find that uh, the solutions are uh, the following. So these are the, the vectors, the vector fields generated the residual gauge diffeomorphism. And they are parameterized by uh, two types of functions. So you have these uh, sigma parameters here uh, that will be uh, the parameters for the virus scaling at the boundary. And you have these, these xi bar uh, vector fields here that will uh, parameterize the boundary diffeomorphism. So now if you use this uh, modified, uh, modified Lie bracket, so this is just the Lie bracket plus uh, some terms here that takes into account uh, the field dependence of these vector fields. So they depend explicitly on the metric. Then you can show that uh, they will satisfy uh, the following commutation relations. Um, so now if you assume that the parameters here uh, do not depend on uh, the solution space, then here these commutation relations just tells you that uh, you simply have uh, the algebra of uh, boundary diffeomorphism times uh, virus scalings. So um, now, uh, as I said, the solution space is parameterized by uh, two types of data. So you have the boundary metric and the holographic stress energy tensor. So for the moment, I will keep these uh, data completely free by uh, in this analysis of the phase space. I will not fix anything. And what you can do is to compute the variation of this data under uh, the, the residual gauge transformations. And you find that the boundary metric will transform under Lie derivative with respect to these uh, boundary diffeomorphism, plus the drag term here uh, that justifies the name of uh, virus scalings for these uh, sigma parameters. Uh, similarly, the holographic stress energy tensor will transform uh, in an homogeneous way here, plus uh, an anomalous term here uh, that appears in uh, odd dimensional space time and that is related to the presence, uh, again, of vile anomalies uh, in the dual theory. So let me just mention that uh, these variations are, are compatible uh, with uh, the modified brackets that uh, I introduced earlier for the residual gauge diffeomorphism. Okay, any question for the, the solution space? So if not, uh, I will move on to the, the phase space of the theory. So uh, I would like to uh, construct the symplectic structure associated with this uh, very general uh, solution space. And the problem is that if you use the standard methods, you will find that uh, the symplectic structure involves some uh, divergence in rho. So to remove this divergence, you can use this uh, holographic renormalization procedure, uh, which consists in the following. So you take the bulk Einstein-Hilbert action here, and uh, you have to add to it some boundary terms. Uh, so here you have the gibbons hawking york term, plus uh, some boundary contour term here, uh, that are such that uh, the on-shell action is finite. 
So here I also added this uh, L not boundary term that is um, uh, the ambiguity in the process uh, to add some finite boundary term to the action. So uh, usually this term will be fixed by the boundary conditions that you consider, uh, but for us they will be useful uh, later when we will consider the, uh, the flat limit of the space time. So uh, this holographic renormalization procedures allows you to obtain this uh, holographically renormalized uh, presymplectic potential. So this is just the bar uh, einstein hilbert uh, presymplectic potential that involves some divergence, uh, and that, uh, that is corrected by the boundary term that you have added to uh, the action here. So they remove the divergence. And at the end, you get the following expression for the value of the presymplectic potential um, at the boundary of the space-time. So it's a D form uh, with respect to the space-time. And uh, it's a one form with respect to the solution space because uh, it involves one variation on, on the solution space. And so you see here appearing uh, again this holographic stress energy tensor. And here is just a variation of uh, the boundary metric. So this um, presymplectic potential is very important because it contains uh, the information about the variational principle. So if you take the variation of the action on shell, uh, you will get uh, that this is equal to uh, the integral of the boundary of this presymplectic potential. So in particular, if you consider a uh, Dirichlet boundary condition, so if you freeze the boundary metric, uh, this presymplectic potential vanishes at uh, the boundary because of this. And therefore, your variational principle will be well-defined. But here, we are not going to impose um, uh, such boundary condition. We are going to keep uh, everything free. So uh, you can go one step further and uh, take one more variation of this uh, presymplectic potential to construct what is called the presymplectic current or presymplectic form. And this is the following object, uh, which contains a very important information about uh, the radiations. So it encodes the flux of charges going through the space-time boundary. So if you are interested uh, by uh, conservative boundary conditions, for example, uh, in ADS uh, here, um, you want to uh, set the value of this presymplectic current to zero at the boundary. So you want to impose some boundary condition on your data here so that uh, you don't have flux at the end and, you, and your charge are conserved. And as I, as I explained, your version of principle will be uh, well-defined. Um, so I explained that for the case of uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, but here we are going to keep these data completely free. And, um, and therefore, uh, in general, we will have some uh, non-conserved charge. We also have to accept that uh, the Varshner principle is not uh, well-defined uh, because this presymplectic potential does not vanish uh, in general. And um, so this will describe typically open gravitational system. And this can be interpreted as uh, the inclusion of uh, the external sources that are encoded in uh, the variation of the boundary metric into the phase space. So as I said, these uh, leaky boundary conditions are very natural for uh, asymptotically de-sitter space-time because you don't want to uh, constrain the Cauchy problem, uh, but they are uh, really non-standard uh, in ADS, and in particular, they will lead to uh, non-globally uh, hyperbolic spacetime, which means that if you provide some data on uh, your Cauchy slice here, you will not be able to predict what will happen in the future because of the leaks going through uh, the spacetime boundary. Okay, any question on this uh, concept of leaky boundary conditions? Okay, so um, 
If not, uh, you can actually derive from this uh, presymplectic current here uh, the gravitational charges of the theory. So basically, what you have to do is to contract one of the entry here with a symmetry of your theory. So you just take one of the delta here um, that appear here, uh, you replace it by uh, the variation that I computed before. And when you do that, uh, you obtain this object, uh, which is uh, a co-dimension two form in uh, the space time. And it's a one form of the solution space. And uh, when you integrate it on a co-dimension two surface at infinity, it will provide you what we called the infinitesimal charge. So this contains the information about the gravitational charges of the theory. Um, so here is the explicit expressions for this uh, uh, object um, when you apply it for the sitter and anti the sitter. And it's made of two pieces. Uh, the first piece contains the uh, boundary diffeomorphism charge, xi bar. So because they involve these uh, xi bar parameters that I introduced before. And the second piece contains uh, the vial charge. So these, uh, because they involve these uh, sigma uh, vial parameters that I introduced. So the boundary diffeomorphism charge here contains uh, the charge that you would expect uh, in ADS, which is just the contraction of uh, the holographic stress energy tensor with a boundary diffeomorphism. But then you also have a correction here that is due to the fact that you allow some fluctuations of the boundary metric. So in the VAR charge, uh, what you can show is that uh, they vanish uh, generically for um, odd dimensional boundary, uh, but they will be non-zero for um, uh, even dimensional boundary. And uh, you can understand that as the fact that you are not free to perform virus scalings in odd dimensional space time. Um, so you are not, in a sense, free to choose the representative of the induced boundary metric at the boundary, which is a sign that you have some uh, vile anomalies in the dual theory. So asymptotic symmetries already contain some information about uh, vile anomalies in, in the dual theory. So as I said, these charge will not be conserved because um, I did not impose any uh, constraints on these um, uh, presymplectic current, and they will not be, uh, they are not integrable, which means that you cannot write uh, this expression with a delta in front of everything. Uh, so it's a one form on the solution space, but you cannot never write a delta because of this kind of uh, obstruction. So non-conservation and uh, non-integrability are actually typical features of uh, dissipative systems. Uh, which is expected because we are uh, studying uh, leaky boundary conditions. OK, so uh, now I would like to write the charge algebra for these uh, expressions. And uh, to do so, I will split my uh, charge into two pieces. So I will uh, write this integrable part and this non-integrable part. So I choose uh, the following split between integrable and non-integrable parts. So it's just uh, a split between uh, the total expression that I obtained before, just a writing. Of course, this split is ambiguous because you can always redefine what you mean by uh, the integrable and the non-integrable part. Um, but uh, if you use the barnish trussard brackets, um, you can actually treat uh, the non-integrability that you have and write meaningful uh, charge algebra. So uh, this bracket was first introduced in the context of uh, asymptotically flat space-time, um, where there was already some flux at uh, uh, the null boundary of the space-time. And so what we did is just to use the same brackets, but in this context of uh, asymptotically locally the sitter and anti the sitter space-time. So this bracket is just given by, uh, let's say, the standard bracket, uh, which is just the variation of the charge with respect to the other uh, generators. 
And you have a correction term here that takes into account the non-integrability of the charge. So uh, when you use this uh, prescription for the brackets, then you can show that uh, it actually closes up to a field-dependent two cycle. So uh, this two cycle here uh, is just anti-symmetric with respect to uh, the exchange between uh, the two symmetries generators. And uh, it satisfies the generalized two cycle conditions. OK, so generalized because here it takes into account some possible field dependence in the in the cycle. So um, let me emphasize that uh, these results about uh, charge algebra, even if the split between the integrable parts and the non integrable part is ambiguous, the general results that the bracket closes up to a field dependent two cycle is non ambiguous. So this this is a very uh, solid mathematical result. Uh, sorry, Roman. Yes. Uh, so Wald and Zupos uh, provided a way for for asymptotically flat space times to to distinguish between the integrable and non-integrable parts. So do you have some similar construction for your general, uh, I mean, ADS or DS space times? Yes, so, so this split uh, recently, so th there are different prescriptions, and I will discuss one in the case of asymptotically flat space time uh, later. Uh, but there was a proposal, for example, by uh, Laurent Fredel and collaborators uh, based on this Neutergan split in the IO world formalism, uh, which is based on also at the level of the variational principle. So when you provide the variational principle, you are able to make such, uh, such a split. And here, since we have a variational principle, we could also uh, propose such a, such a split. Uh, but here in the analysis, I uh, since this paper uh, was written a bit uh, before these, uh, these recent results, we kept uh, the freedom to uh, exchange integrable and uh, non-integrable piece uh, to, to uh, make the distribution uh, as we want. Uh, just to signal that uh, for um, even dimensional space time. If you choose this uh, to be the integrable piece, then you don't have any uh, cocycle in the right hand side here. So if you choose another prescription for uh, the integrable and the non integral part, then uh, you will get a cocycle. So that can make a motivation uh, to choose this, uh, this prescription. Yeah. So uh, these uh, mathematical results about uh, the charge algebra uh, contains some uh, very important physical information uh, because it encodes the flux balance laws of the theory. So if you take one of the symmetry here um, in, the, in the bracket to be just the time translations, which are part of the residual gauge uh, diffeomorphism, so there will be time translation in ADS or uh, radial translation in, uh, in the theta. Uh, then you will get uh, this uh, non-conservation law. So it tells you how much the charge is non-conserved due to the flux uh, going through the space-time boundary. So it tells you that the non-conservation of the charge is related to uh, the non-integrability uh, psi that I introduced before. So there is this entanglement between uh, non-integrability and non-conservation. And there is also a contribution uh, with the cocycle, the field dependent cocycle that appear in the algebra. So that's a very important result when you are uh, treating leaky boundary conditions, uh, because it really gives you some important uh, physical information about the system uh, without knowing all the details about uh, the bulk metric uh, in the space time. So you have really the information about uh, the non conservation. Um, so let me say a word about uh, this uh, two cycle that appears in the algebra. Uh, as I said before, if you make uh, uh, the good split between uh, integrable and non-integrable piece, you can show that this uh, cycle can be set uh, to zero for odd dimensional boundary, uh, but it will be non-vanishing for even dimensional boundary or generic situations. 
And um, if you restrict the analysis uh, to the case d equals two, and if you impose bon uh, directly boundary conditions, then you can show that all these results about uh, charge algebra and uh, field dependent cocycle and so on uh, reduces precisely to the Brown Eno analysis, uh, where you recover uh, the centrally extended uh, Vira Zero uh, algebra. So everything is consistent. Uh, when you turn up the sources. Okay, so this ends the first part of my talk. Um, now I would like to uh, discuss uh, the BMS uh, symmetries in ADS. Uh, but first, if there is any questions uh, concerning this part, please uh, ask. So uh, if not, I will uh, just proceed. Um, so first, let me make a little recap about uh, these uh, BMS symmetries in asymptotically flat space-time. So I will consider radiative space-time uh, in uh, asymptotically flat space-time at null infinity. And in this case, the asymptotic symmetry group is uh, given by the BMS group, as uh, Andrea uh, uh, told us on Monday. Uh, which is given by this uh, Lorentz group times the super translations. So this is an infinite dimensional announcement of uh, the Poincaré group with the super translations. So the action of the super translation on the conformal boundary is uh, depicted on this uh, conformal diagram in blue. And um, so there are these symmetries, these super translations are absolutely essential if you want to encode to include the radiation into your analysis. So later, uh, various extensions of the BMS group have been proposed with uh, super rotations. So there was this uh, barnish trussard uh, proposal with um, the double copy of the wheat algebra for uh, the super rotations. Then later, there was this proposal uh, by Compiglia and Lada with these uh, uh, DFS2 super rotations. And finally, recently, there was this analysis of Fredel and collaborators um, by uh, including these vile symmetries into the, the phase space analysis. Um, BMS symmetries have known uh, a renewed interest these, uh, let's say, 10, uh, last 10 years because of their connection with uh, soft theorems and uh, memory effects unveiled by uh, Strominger and collaborators. So um, in this framework, some natural questions arise. Uh, is it possible to define the analog of the BMS group for a non-vanishing cosmological constant? And uh, if yes, we will call it the lambda BMS group. And uh, is there a concept of flat limits where uh, we can just take the cosmological constant to recover the standard results of asymptotically flat spacetime? Um, so these are the questions that I'm going to uh, address now. Okay, so uh, here I will start again with asymptotically locally uh, the sitter and anti sitter space-time, and I will impose these uh, partial Dirichlet boundary conditions. So these are conditions on the component of the boundary metric. Here, Q0 is just uh, the determinant of uh, the unit sphere. So uh, let me emphasize that by imposing these boundary condition, I still allow some fluctuations of uh, the transverse components of the boundary metric. Okay, so these are not directly boundary conditions, but only partial directly. And this is fundamental in the, in the analysis. So what you can show is that uh, these boundary conditions can always be reached uh, when you, once you are in the starobinsky fefferman gram gauge by using the freedom that you have with the residual gauge isomorphism. Uh, so you can show that with a, a counting argument. And it means that you are not losing any solution in your space time by imposing these boundary conditions. In particular, it means that it will not constrain uh, the Cauchy problem in uh, asymptotically de sitter uh, space time. So uh, now, if you look at the diffeomorphism that preserves these uh, uh, boundary conditions, you will, you will find uh, the following constraints 
on the parameters uh, uh, on the residual gate isomorphism. And again, you can uh, use this modified bracket for a residual gauge morphism here uh, to write the commutation relations for these uh, vector fields satisfying these conditions. So you find uh, these commutation relations here. And the first observation is that um, they are explicitly field dependent because they involve this uh, dependence in uh, the transverse component of the boundary metric. So this is why I will call it uh, a Lie algebraid uh, and not a Lie algebra. It's because it depends on the point of the solution space that uh, you are looking at. Uh, but what you can show is that at each point of the solution space, uh, it contains an infinite dimensional of so-called uh, area preserving diffeomorphism. So I will, I will call this uh, algebraid the lambda BMS Lie algebraid for the following reason. Uh, if you take the flat limit of these uh, complicated commutation relations, uh, then if you are familiar with uh, asymptotically flat space time here, you will recognize uh, the commutation relations of uh, one of the extensions of the BMS group in flat space, which is uh, the generalized BMS extension with the diff DFS uh, super rotations. So this justifies the name of lambda BMS uh, Lie algebra here for this uh, for these symmetries. Okay, so uh, we have found uh, that at the level of the symmetries, um, uh, the flat limit works perfectly. Namely, you recover the BMS symmetries in the in, in flat space. So now we would like to ask the same question at the level of the phase space of the theory. So to do so, uh, I will write uh, the symplectic structure of uh, lambda BMS. So this, uh, this is just obtained by uh, plugging these boundary conditions here um, that were necessary to find lambda BMS into uh, this very generic uh, presymplectic current that uh, I wrote before. And uh, you get this uh, result here. And again, non surprisingly, it's a non vanishing uh, expression. Uh, because we are also treating asymptotically the space spacetime. And uh, in particular, these are leaky boundary conditions, so the lambda BMS charge will not be conserved uh, nor integrable. Um, the problem if you want to study the flat limit of this uh, phase space is that uh, you cannot work uh, directly into the Pfefferman Gram gauge because this gauge does not admit such, uh, such a limit. Um, an alternative to, to, uh, to this problem is to work uh, into the bounding gauge. Uh, so this gauge exists for uh, both non-vanishing and vanishing cosmological constant. So the strategy here is to uh, uh, construct an explicit diffeomorphism to go from the pfefferman gram gauge where uh, all the computations have been done, so the holographic renormalization, uh, the charge algebra, and translate everything into the bounding gauge where the flat limit is well defined. Um, so from now on, I will work for uh, D equals three, which means that I am in a four dimensional space time, uh, which I think is the most interesting um, uh, case. And uh, let me just emphasize that uh, you can also generalize these results uh, or extend these results in the case uh, of 3D gravity, um, but the analysis in higher dimension has not yet, yet uh, been performed. Okay, so let me uh, introduce this uh, bounding gauge that is valid for all uh, uh, lambda. So the bounding coordinates are given by these uh, retarded time coordinates, U, uh, these radial coordinates, R, and uh, XA, which are just uh, the angles the celestial sphere. So um, the boundary metric, sorry, the, the bondy metric uh, takes uh, the following form. And uh, the gauge fixing is completed by imposing this uh, determinant condition. So now if you solve uh, the Einstein's equation uh, in presence of a non-vanishing cosmological constant, 
uh, in the bond leakage after imposing the lambda BMS boundary conditions that I presented before, you will get the following expansion in R for uh, the functions appearing in your metric. So in particular, it will start with the order R square here with uh, the boundary metric QAB, which is free on in our analysis. Um, you will also have this uh, CAB here, which is uh, the asymptotic shear and which plays an important role uh, in the flat limit. Um, you have this function NA here, which is uh, called the um, angular momentum aspect. So it contains information about the angular momentum of the solution. And here M is uh, the bondy mass aspect. So it's related to uh, the mass of your solution. Um, and for example, you can write uh, global de Sitter or anti de Sitter space time into the bondy gauge by just uh, writing, uh, taking the following values for uh, the functions appearing in this metric. So now I will. Um, use this dictionary between uh, Pfefferman Graham and uh, Bondi gauge to uh, translate the data that I defined in Pfefferman Graham gauge so, such that this uh, holographic stress energy tensor and express it in terms of uh, functions defined in Bondi gauge. So for example, the TT component of the uh, holographic stress energy tensor is just related to uh, the Bondi mass. Uh, the TA component here is related to uh, the angular momentum aspect. And finally, the transverse components of the stress energy tensor here are related to this um, order uh, that appears here uh, in the expansion of your metric. So um, let me emphasize here that uh, if you take the flat limit of this uh, solution space in uh, uh, the sitter and anti the sitter, uh, you will precisely recover uh, the solution space that you would have obtained by solving uh, the Einstein's equation in bondy gauge in asymptotically flat space time. So, so the flat limit works perfectly at the level of the symmetries, but also at the level of the solution space. So now let me ask the same question. Uh, does the flat limit work at the level of uh, the symplectic structure? So can you recover the BMS charges in the flat limit? So the problem here uh, is that if you try to uh, translate uh, this symplectic structure of uh, lambda BMS into uh, the bond in terms of bondy data, then you will find that it goes like one over lambda. So it means that you are not allowed to readily take uh, lambda going to zero. Uh, you, you have to do something. And uh, what we found is that uh, to circumvent this problem, you can play uh, at the level of the holographically renormalized action with this ambiguity uh, to add finite boundary term to the action. And actually what we found is that uh, if you add some uh, specific corner terms into this action, um, you will be able to remove the one over lambda term at the level of the symplectic structure. And so after doing that, uh, you can actually save, uh, take safely uh, this um, flat limit. Sorry. So um, when you do so, when you take lambda going to zero, uh, this is one of the main results of this uh, talk, is that uh, so you start from um, uh, this uh, symplectic structure of lambda BMS, which is renormalized both in rho and in lambda. Uh, and if you take the flat limit, you will precisely recover the symplectic structure of asymptotically flat space time that was obtained by uh, very different considerations. So uh, this is a non-trivial check of this, uh, of this expression in flat space here, uh, because it really goes uh, by, by going into holographic renormalization into uh, ADS and uh, flat limit procedure uh, before uh, finally taking the flat limit. So we can be sure that uh, this expression is actually uh, correct. So uh, what we have learned here is that um, the, the flat limit works both at the level of the symmetries, 
but also at the level of the phase space and the symplectic structure. Okay, so uh, now uh, starting from this symplectic structure in asymptotically flat space time, uh, you can play the same game and uh, deduce uh, the expressions for uh, the gravitational charges uh, associated to BMS symmetries. So you play the same game, you contract the symplectic structure with uh, a symmetry, and uh, you integrate this codimension two form on a uh, two sphere at uh, null infinity. And uh, what you will obtain is a non integrable expression, again, because uh, as an asymptotically flat space time, as I explained uh, at the beginning of my talk, uh, exhibit also leaky boundary conditions. So the char will not be conserved uh, nor integrable. And um, you can either play the same game that uh, we, have, we have done here by using this uh, barnish troussard bracket and uh, writing some flux balance laws. Uh, and in particular, it will encode uh, the bondy mass loss formula that I introduced uh, at the beginning. But another possibility is to play uh, with this ambiguity uh, in the splits between integrable and non integrable parts. And indeed, uh, in this paper, we uh, provide a prescription to, um, to write a meaningful charges for uh, BMS symmetries by isolate, is isolating a specific integrable part in the charge. And uh, so here's our proposal for this expression. Uh, it involves so the super translation generators and uh, the super rotations generator. So here, M-bar is just our proposal for uh, the gravitational mass. And uh, N-bar here is our proposal for the angular momentum uh, aspect. So um, this prescription has several uh, uh, advantages, but the main interest is that uh, it satisfies, um, so it, it's, um, it form, the charges form a representation of the BMS symmetries at the corner of uh, scry plus of null infinity. So you don't have to use any modified bracket here to write uh, this algebra. You, you use the standard bracket. And you don't have any central extension or field dependent to cycle. Um, so you can rephrase these results in terms of uh, the BMS flux. Uh, so these, the BMS flux are just uh, the integrated expression over U of these uh, uh, local flux here. Um, and uh, so this result translates in the following way. So it tells you that uh, this bracket uh, closes and form a representation of the BMS symmetries without uh, central extensions. So these BMS flux will play uh, a fundamental role in uh, celestial holography, uh, as Laurel will explain in uh, her talk of uh, tomorrow. OK, so um, let me summarize uh, the results that um, I have presented. Um, so here, I have considered uh, leaky boundary conditions in both asymptotically locally de Sitter and anti de Sitter space time. And um, I have uh, shown that I've shown that there were two types of charge, the vile charge and the boundary diffeomorphism charge. And in particular, I have explained that uh, the vile charge already contains information about uh, the vile anomalies in the dual theory. Then I have written uh, this uh, charge algebra in uh, asymptotically, uh, locally, uh, de Sitter and anti de Sitter space time by uh, using this uh, barnish troussard bracket to treat the non integrability. And uh, I have explained that uh, when you freeze the sources, so when you are back to conservative boundary conditions, all the results uh, consistently reduce to uh, the standard result of uh, the standard results of. Um, of uh, Brown and O uh, with Dirichlet boundary conditions. And uh, finally, in the second part of my, uh, of my presentation, I have um, uh, explained how to find uh, such a BMS symmetries in presence of non-vanishing cosmological constant. And uh, uh, we have seen that uh, the flat limit works both at the level of the symmetries that allowed us to find one of the extensions of BMS 
And it also works at the level of the phase space uh, by renormalize, renormalizing uh, this uh, symplectic structure. And finally, I also mentioned a new prescription for uh, the BMS charges and the BMS flux that uh, nicely uh, represents the BMS, um, uh, the BMS symmetries. So let me finally uh, mention some uh, perspective of this work uh, that could be interesting to, uh, to uh, investigate in the future. So first, uh, it will be, I think, uh, interesting to understand the meaning of leaky boundary conditions in holography. Uh, what's it, what does it mean uh, to study holography with open uh, gravitational systems? Um, so my opinion is that um, Understanding orography with such leaky boundary conditions uh, will give us some uh, access to flat space holography through a flat limit procedure as the one uh, I have explained in this, uh, in this talk. And in particular, if you consider the, for example, the free gravity correspondence, uh, this flat limit works perfectly. So in ADS, you start with uh, a relativistic field at the boundary. And then you just take uh, the flat limit in the bulk. And at the end, you, you find uh, a fluid that is uh, ultra relativistic and that lives at uh, the null boundary scry of uh, asymptotically flat space time. So it will be interesting to uh, extend these results to, uh, to ADS CFT. Another interesting question is that uh, here I have obtained a particular extension of BMS uh, in the flat limit. But maybe it will be possi uh, possible uh, to find some uh, other extensions, such that this uh, recently introduced uh, VI BMS uh, group. And uh, finally, a third point that I would like to mention is that um, uh, it will be interesting to uh, investigate this infrared triangle in uh, ADS or DS. Uh, namely, can we relate uh, the lambda BMS symmetries? with some kind of uh, memory effects or soft theorems in presence of a non-vanishing cosmological constant. So I think it's a, it's a very exciting question. OK, so I will stop here. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Ah, thank you, Roman, for your talk. Uh, we have a couple minutes left for questions. So uh, let's just uh, consider the, the chat open for uh, whoever raises their hand. Ah, I see Dio has a question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? My connection's a little unstable. Yes, I hear you well. Yeah. I uh, thank you for the nice talk. I was wondering if there was anything that could be said uh, about a slightly more general FRW type universes or slowly rolling type universes that don't require a strict lambda. So is there a notion of asymptotic symmetries for an FRW, a more general FRW space time? I haven't seen much work on that kind of question. Maybe you could comment on that. Yes, yes. Uh, so I know that there are some, uh, some recent investigation uh, in, in this, uh... Uh, in these FLRW metric with some uh, BMS symmetries uh, by uh, Prabhu and, uh, and collaborator, I think. Um, but this is a question that we have tried uh, to investigate. And actually, I think it's very promising to go into this direction because, uh, because of the memory effects, for example, uh, that could be uh, physically relevant uh, to, to investigate in a FLRW, FLRW uh, space time. Uh, because this is our universe, of course. And uh, I think from the Lambda BMS results that we have here, uh, this is something technically uh, doable. This is my, uh, my opinion. But, uh, but uh, yes, I have not no more to say because uh, I didn't have uh, any strong results into that direction, but I'm very optimistic, I would say. Can, Thank you. can I comment on this question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, straightforward to include scalars and other fields uh, on all the discussion. I think one just needs to repeat the very last part of the analysis. I think the uh, symplectic analysis has already been done in 2005. So all of this uh, 
So I, I don't I don't see I don't see any problem in uh, extending this. Most of it actually is already out there. Hi. Um, to I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but uh, uh open. Yeah, so thanks for the nice talk. So I have two questions. So you mentioned that for Lambda BMS4, actually you put UA0 to be zero, right? In bonding gauge. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, and but the thing is, that, is that unique? Because if you look at the Bondi equation itself, so there is a couple equation between del U Q A B and U A zero, and which is related to the leading order term. I think it is related to C A B. And my question is that is that choice unique? So I can either choose del U Q A B equals to zero or U A equals to zero. Yeah. Uh, okay. Very so good question. So why so, do you prefer yeah, to um, choose U A to U A zero to be zero? I think you could use a different. So here it's a choice of uh, boundary condition, uh, boundary conditions. But of course you can uh, um, choose a different uh, boundary gauge fixing. And as yeah. the, the one, for example, I think you consider uh, in, in your paper. And um, mm. I think uh, so. This choice here is, I would say, the most adapted for uh, the flat limit because you readily obtain uh, all the solution space and the symmetries. In the bondy gauge that you know very well uh, in asymptotically flat space time, so I would say that it's for convenience that we are choosing this uh, this uh, foliation of uh, of the boundary by choosing this uh, boundary gauge fixing. But I'm I'm sure that you can uh, actually change this uh, boundary uh, gauge fixing and still obtain some uh, lambda BMS symmetry. Uh, this choice is uh, is not unique. Uh, that that I'm convinced of that. Okay. And the next question is that how this UA zero to be zero is uh, relevant for any physical space time, say for car dissiter or car anti dissiter. Uh, you mean uh, the, the fact that we allow uh, this uh, fluctuation of the boundary? No, no so uh, I mean that so for lambda BMS, you put UA zero to be zero, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that how it is relevant for this condition to be hold for car dissiter space time or car anti dissiter. So if you write card dissiter or and dissiter in bondy gauge, then will you be able to put U A zero to be zero? Yes, 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 yes. You can put care in uh, in bondy gauge. I think uh, without uh, without any issue. So care care I think can already be put Not in the, car, the Dirichlet. But car in the care metric can already put in the be put in the in the Dirichlet boundary conditions. Uh, so here, since we are extending, considering more general boundary conditions. I don't see any obstruction for that. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So the question I am asking because that uh, car dissiter space time so recent you have write, written in terms of bondy coordinate. Mm -hmm. but it is really hard to look for a diffeomorphism which put you U A zero to be zero actually. But it satisfies all the equation of motion. But that why that part we don't see actually. That's why I'm a little bit. Uh, do you yeah, see it's so, difficult to uh, to put care uh, in uh, the bondy gauge because for yes, example yes, I know exactly that it uh, is uh, difficult so it is difficult to put car dissiter itself in bondy gauge also okay okay but if you put car dissiter in bondy gauge then you can see that all the equations of motions are satisfied exactly but the putting this boundary gauge fixing ev0 to be 0 it still looks very non trivial to me or I, i'm not sure whether you can put uh, or not but, but I would say that uh, since uh, you can write care into Pfefferman Graham gauge, uh, now you can just use the diffeomorphism uh, to write it into the bond gauge. But okay, maybe there is an obstruction with that, with, uh, with the UA term that you, you mentioned. But okay, yeah. uh, that's yeah. that I will have to, mm -hmm. to have a, a precise. Okay, one. okay, thanks for the talk. Thanks for that. Thank you. Then uh, I'll hand over the floor to Rugalo. Uh, hi, Ruben. Uh, nice Hello. to see you. Uh, thanks for the talk. I have just two brief questions. Uh, the first one is uh, regarding the, the last uh, term in the action that you are uh, adding. The, you, I mean, I think you, you, you called it I0, right? Yes, yes. I L0, yeah. yeah. And I would like to know if you, I mean, how is it determined and exactly if you have a, a meaning for this uh, for this addition, which I may, maybe I, you 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 said it and and I missed it, uh, but okay. 
<clears throat> yes, so so when you want to have, uh, when you impose um, uh, conservative boundary conditions, such as, for example, uh, say Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, then you don't even need this term, actually, uh, because your variational principle will be uh, well-defined uh, for that. But it may happen that you have some other boundary conditions that okay. may require the adding of this, uh, of this additional uh, finite term. Uh, but here it was really useful for us uh, because it allowed us to remove these uh, one over lambda uh, terms in the expression, uh, thanks to corner terms, actually. So it's not even a boundary term that we need, but really some corner term. Uh, and, and this is a freedom that you have in, the, in this holographic renormalization, since you just, uh, at least for us, we just require that uh, the action is finite in shape. And uh, is this maybe related to some topological property of the manifold? Because you know, in, in four dimensions, this the the count the the the, the counter terms on on ADS uh, are interpreted in terms of uh, Gauss Bonnet uh, topological term. So I was wondering if this uh, last term is also related to some topological properties of the manifold or not. Okay, that, that may be possible. Uh, I don't have a okay. precise comment to make, but um, yeah, that, okay. that could be interesting to, to investigate. And uh, last one um, is, uh, you, you said that this, uh, the, this uh, leaky boundary conditions uh, can have some problems with the global uh, hyperbolicity of the manifold, right? Yes, yes. And this, my, this second question is related to what you said uh, at last uh, in the last slide. Uh, so how would you interpret this loss of global hyperbolicity um, in the context of ADS CFT? Um, okay, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm not a specialist of ADS CFT, so I will not uh, make any uh, strong claim in this direction. But I think it might be related to uh, a loss of unitarity or something like this in the in the dual theory. So you are not basically uh, able to to uh, predict what will happen in the future because of these of these leaks. Uh, and okay. uh, so yeah, that, yeah. that's uh, yeah, that's all what I can say for for the moment. But I think it's a really uh, appealing direction uh, to investigate uh, for for many reasons. But uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Then the final question goes to Elliot. Um, hi, Romain. Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested about, about your talk, and I have a small question regarding uh, the motivation. So, do you think is so if, if the only thing I care about is getting BMS symmetry from a flat limit of ADS CFT, is it necessary to consider leaky boundary conditions? Because after after all it's true that flat space arises to, as a flat limit of ADS. So I should be able to get BMS symmetry from the standard boundary conditions in ADS, no? So, so what we found is that, for example, if you start with Dirichlet boundary conditions, so no leaky boundary condition, in the limit, you will just get uh, the Poincaré symmetries. So you right. will not have the super translation into, uh, into your asymptotic symmetry group. So if you want so to, to include radiative space, space time in the limit, and really, uh, you can do that, uh, see that in the equation, how the radiation, uh, uh, where the radiation goes in the flat limit. Uh, you you need to uh, to include uh, these uh, these leaks in ADS. At least this is the the way that uh, that we see it in the in the limit. Right. Just some some final comment about that. I, I do understand how you get the Poincaré symmetry from this limit, but I do wonder if there is some other limit you can take in which you actually get something bigger than Poincaré. So for for example, I. So I, I know you're very interested in four dimensions, but for example, in three dimensions, it is known how to contract the Pirasoro algebra into the BMS3 algebra. Yes. And I, I guess I wonder what, it, what is the relation between that contraction and the work that you have presented today if we applied it to three dimensions? Yes, so very good. Actually, they are exactly, uh, well, the, the same. This is just the lift of that to the four dimensional case. Uh, but if you want to do it in four dimensions, and have captured the super translations, uh, you really need uh, these uh, to consider these leaky boundary conditions. So we, are, we really started from the 3D case that we know very well uh, in the bonding gauge, for example, we know how to take the flat limit in 3D and we lifted all the results in 4D. And this is how we deduce this, uh, this lambda BMS uh, group. So this lambda BMS story, if I do it in three dimensions, 
this is basically this this contraction of the virus or right? yes yes uh, okay. Okay. bms bms group lambda bms in 3d just reduces to the the virus or symmetries uh, it reduces to directly uh, uh, boundary condition i would say I see. Okay, that's that's interesting. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Costas, do you have something like? Yeah, I have maybe a couple of comments. Uh, <clears throat> I think you seem to suggest you need leaky, leaky boundary conditions to get uh, radiating space space times. But you can have uh, Robinson Troutman in ADS with standard Dirichlet boundary conditions, which is a radiating space time. I don't think that's uh, necessary. Right. The, the, the reason I asked the question is because I was I, I envisioned flat space time as some region somewhere near the center of ADS, such that if you, if you zoom in into that region and you have some observer that only has access to physics below the ADS lens scale, then that observer will see flat space physics. But I mean, it seems yeah. to me it should be possible to get um, BMS from standard boundary conditions. Right. Right. That's what I was asking. I, I also think it should be possible, but. I guess, of course, so I, I agree that there is another kind of limit uh, by taking this uh, uh, the ADS radius to be very large, so that uh, uh, you end up at in the center with an asymptotically flat region. So that may be another uh, picture in which you could consider a flat limit. So here, this is a bit different to what we have considered because we are we're really around the, the boundary, and uh, this is where we take uh, the, the limit. Also, you comment, uh, Romain, that, that you made about that, that you got only the Poincaré. Did you use, when you said Dirichlet, you, you keep fixed the metric, not the conformer class? If you're allowed to keep a conformer class, will this give you a bigger asymptotic symmetry group? Um, so, OK, that, that's um, a good question. Um, actually, I think it will give uh, the, same, the same problem. Uh, maybe you would have some. Uh, some um, I think you could use you, you will still obtain the, the conformal symmetries as uh, as asymptotic symmetries as, as it's known. Uh, so I'd, I'm not sure you could obtain uh, BMS. Uh, actually, I'm sure that you could not obtain that you could obtain uh, BMS symmetries in the flat limit. Um, it, it's not enough. You really need some flux uh, going through the space time boundary. And you can still have flux going through the space time boundary and have in the boundary conditions where you keep fix the conformal class. I, I don't think that the two are contradictory of one another. Yes, yes. So the, this one, yeah, I agree. So this one is a, a relaxation of the like the strict directly boundary condition where you really fix the representative. So you can allow it to uh, to to vary. Uh, but then if you if you do that, uh, I guess you can you will not capture the information about uh, the vial charge, for example, that I've described here. Uh, because it was important for us to uh, to make difference uh, between metrics that are conformally related. Uh, so this allowed us to include the vial symmetries into the analysis. Uh, that's. No, I mean, if, if you have anomalies, you have to fix a metric. You cannot fix. Yes, exactly. That exactly. Anomalies. That, that, this this is precisely what, what we see with a non vanishing charge in a, in other dimensional space time. Maybe one more question. So this, this lump and the part with this corner counter term. You didn't give an expression in the slides. Is this a covariant expression? Is it a local? OK, uh, yes, good question. So you, you can make it covariant with respect to some boundary structure. Uh, so when basically you choose here uh, your foliation to, uh, to, to choose your uh, lambda BMS boundary conditions, then uh, it, it defines you uh, some uh, boundary structure. And uh, you can use this boundary structure to construct these uh, corner term uh, that allows you to, to take the flat limit. 